Shabbat Shalom. As we've gone through Exodus, we've been looking at the chapters that deal with the construction of the place where God would dwell among His people. And then we've been reading the part that sets apart a particular family, which is the family of Aaron uh, and the Levites. In chapter 30 today, we're going to be looking at a couple of things. It's a short passage. It's only 21 verses, the portion today in Exodus 30. I think it's probably worth reading it. Three main ideas, an altar of incense, the census for the children of Israel, and then the laver. Moreover, you shall make an altar as a place for burning incense. You shall make it of acacia wood. Its length shall be a cubit, its width a cubit, it shall be square, and its height shall be two cubits. So it's a very small altar that's quite it's twice as tall as it is wide and long. Its horn shall be of one piece with it. And you probably remember all altars are built with horns at the corners. You shall overlay it with pure gold, its top and its sides all around, and its horns, and you shall make a gold molding all around for it. You shall make two gold rings for it under its molding, you shall make them on its two side walls on opposite sides, and they shall be holders for poles with which to carry it. In other words, these alt everything in the tabernacle is made to be portable. It's not like it was in the temple where things were stationary. The, the tabernacle was going to be moving as they went throughout the desert, so everything had rings on it that you could put poles through and carry it. You shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold. You shall put this ark altar in front of the veil that is near the ark of the testimony, in front of the mercy seat that is over the ark of the testimony where I will meet with you. Aaron shall burn fragrant incense on it. He shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. When Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he shall burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord throughout your generations. You shall not offer any strange incense on this altar, or burnt offering, or meal offering. And you shall not pour out a drink offering on it. So if, if you can get straight in your mind, the entrance to the temple of the tabernacle is always from the east, and you go west. Going west in scripture is the way of holiness. And something sometimes, because Christians always look to the east, they think, you know, that's where the Lord's coming from. The scripture seems to indicate that. For whatever reasons, and I can't say I know, in scripture, holiness is a direction and it's going west. And the most holy place is the most western of the uh, compartments of the sanctuary. So this altar of incense, there's a courtyard that has the altar of sacrifice and the laver. Then you pass through a curtain into the tent of meeting and that first compartment that's called the holy place has the menorah on one side and the table of the bread of the presence or the show bread as it says on the north side. So you have the lamp over here, the table of the show bread, then right in front of the curtain is the altar of incense. And so there's something being said here that, in a sense, the way into the most holy place is passed or through this altar of incense. In fact, on the Day of Atonement, when the priest went in, the high priest went in several times, of course, the first thing he did was take incense back there, put it on the coals, and then he filled the most holy place with the smoke of the incense all the time he was going in and out. So the incense is very important and this altar is specific. You can't offer any animals on it. You can't pour blood on it. You can't pour a drink offering on it. Make no grain offerings. It's specifically only for incense offering. And it says, Aaron shall make atonement on its horns once a year. This would be on the Day of Atonement. 
He shall make atonement on it with the blood of the sin offering of atonement once a year throughout your generations. It is most holy to the Lord. And of course, it says it is most holy to Yahweh in the scripture. Now you probably remember a sin offering was made for Aaron and the priests. Then a sin offering was made for the people from, for a goat, a bull and a goat. This blood was mixed and uh, taken back. Now the next, it moves on to a completely different subject. Yahweh also spoke to Moses saying, when you take a census of the sons of Israel to number them, then each one of them shall give a ransom for himself to Yahweh when you number them so that there will be no plague among them when you number them. See, that's interesting. He says, you're going to number them, you're going to count them, but to prevent the plague, there has to be a ransom paid. This is what everyone who is numbered shall give, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 giras. Half a shekel as a contribution to Yahweh or to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered from 20 years old and over shall give the contribution to Yahweh. The rich shall not pay more and the poor shall not pay less than the half shekel. <coughs> when you give the contribution to Yahweh to make atonement for yourselves, you shall take the atonement money from the sons of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may be a memorial for the sons of Israel before the Lord to make atonement for yourselves. You remember when they were, God told Moses to build the sanctuary, one of the most important things regarded that all the material used to build it had to be a free will offering. Nothing could be used that was forced, coerced, demanded. So the entire building for worship the courtyard all came from free will offerings. Now we find when God counts Israel, every Israelite is to pay, make an equal contribution to the upkeep of the sanctuary. And in this case, it's kind of another lesson being taught. It doesn't matter how rich you are or how poor you are, you all have an equal stake in it. The sanctuary doesn't belong any more to the rich than it does to the poor or the in-between. They all give the same amount and what's more if they don't give this amount it says a plague will come on them you'll notice in scripture the counting of people is a very careful thing you know when David counted the fighting men to see how strong he was it brought a curse upon Israel and so when you count Israel it has to be for the right motivation and here it's to count them, everybody owes a half shekel. Now it goes down to verse 17. Yahweh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, you shall also make a laver of bronze with its base of bronze for washing. And you shall put it between the tent of meeting and the altar. And you shall put water in it. Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet from it. When they enter the tent of meeting, they shall wash with water so that they will not die. Or when they approach the altar to minister by offering up in smoke a fire sacrifice to Yahweh. So they shall wash their hands and their feet so that they will not die. And it shall be a perpetual statute for them, for Aaron and his descendants throughout their generations. And those of you who have gone through the sanctuary, we talk about this a lot, that when you approach the Lord, there are certain steps that are always there. And it is steps. Uh, I hope that this starts to make sense to people there are so many things in life that order doesn't matter and then there are other things where order makes all the difference you can't do the wrong step at the wrong time and so the labor at, first off <coughs> excuse me to come into the courtyard you had to come through a gate this is something that I keep emphasizing, and I think if you understand all entrances into holy places go through a gate or an opening, you start to understand your need for a savior. You can't come into the courtyard over the wall. If you do, you don't belong there, and you're unholy, you're under judgment. You must come through the gate. When you come through the gate into the courtyard, the first thing that you're presented with is the altar and the laver. And the first thing you do is wash. You do not make an offering without washing. What does it say will happen if you don't wash? It says you'll die. 
And this, uh, I still, I'm baffled. I, I've studied this for years, and I still don't completely understand the washing of the laver. And it gets confused in my mind with atonement. But recognize atonement is not the washing of the water. Atonement is the sacrifice. The blood is poured out at the altar for atonement. The washing is something a little different. And, you know, it's, we know that we are washed with the water of the word. Scripture says that several times. And interestingly enough, if you go later on here in Exodus, it tells us that this labor was made with the mirrors of the serving girls. And you think, well, how could you do that? Well, think about it. How many mirrors did they have like we have? Glass. They didn't. Mirrors were very finely polished metal. That was the mirrors that they used. So what does that tell us about the laver? In some way, it tells us that when you look at the laver, you saw yourself. Remember what James says about that? He says, anybody who's a hearer of the word only, what does he do when he looks in a mirror? Do you recall what it says? He says he looks and he walks away. I'll turn to it. In other words, you look in the mirror and you see your hair is messed up, though. That's hard to tell nowadays because I've noticed that carefully combed hair looks messed up to me. And I still haven't joined this generation. They work so hard and I think, I could have done that by just rubbing my hair in the ground and filling it full of axle grease or something. Uh, it just, anyway. But James says, you look in the mirror, these little books, you have to be careful, they fly by. This James 1, do, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. This is important to us if we see the labor as a picture of the word because it means that when we wash in the word that we don't just hear it. In fact, just hearing the word does absolutely nothing, which is what James points out. And Yeshua told a parable. What parable did Yeshua tell us that tells us that hearing the word does absolutely nothing? The kids sing a song. The wise man built his house upon what? What was the difference in the parable of the wise man and the foolish man between the two? One on the rock, one on the sand, but what practically? What, what makes a man or a woman's life built on the rock? Obedient. Obedient. See, I asked my I, we would read this in Bible class. Because I and it's, it, Yeshua doesn't even make it hard. He says what the... And I would say, what's the difference between the man who built his house on the rock and the one on the sand? And invariably they would say, well, the man who built his house on the rock believed. And I would grind my teeth and scream. Because that's not what it says. The man who built his house on the sand heard the words of Yeshua and did not put them into practice. So he ended up with a house, but it was built on sand. He said, the one who heard my words and put them into practice, his house is built on a rock. And so James comes and he says the same thing. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. What's the purpose of looking in the mirror? To see, did I wash my face this morning? Did I comb my hair? And for us poor men, did I shave? Of course, a lot of people don't. And they would know that too. James says, okay, so you looked in the mirror. What was the value of looking in the mirror if you didn't take in the input and make an appropriate action? But the man who looks inter intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this, not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it, will be blessed in what he does. The point is, something in the labor, something that Aaron and his sons did when they washed, 
It was an appropriation of the word and it was a commitment to do what it says. We are not cleansed by thinking. One of the banes of Americans and American Christianity is this idea that if I agree with it or I thought it, I've done it. I, I, I do this all the time. You think about it, you've really thought hard about it, you think, well, okay, on to the next thing. You know, Mike Clayton, I think, is the one who said that understanding usually comes from obeying. It doesn't come from thinking. And in life, we understand this. When you go to vet school, like I did, they do a lot of theory. They teach you a lot of physiology and anatomy and all that kind of stuff. But you know what they do the last two years? They make you do what you've been talking about because they know very well how many of you would be willing to do a surgery if I got up here and gave a four-hour explanation on how it's done? Ron probably would. Why? He's done it before. How do you teach a person to be a surgeon? They have to do it. You understand that. If Doug wants us to learn piano, or he's teaching you piano, he may teach you some theory. He certainly will teach you the names of the notes and the names of chords. But how do you learn to play piano? You won't until you do it. I am amazed at my own mind and a lot of believers' minds that we think we can read this and understand it and, and go deep into it and it will have any impact on our lives at all. It doesn't until we do it. And it's all through the whole thing. Something in the labor is reminding us that your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. It has to do, and it, so it does deal with repentance because what do you do when you wash? You wash off the dirt. And in that time, they were in the desert, they would have been barefooted because they were in a holy place and they would be walking in the sand. And so the important thing they washed with their hands and their feet, the what, what they did and where they went. And this labor always comes before you go to the altar of sacrifice, which we'll talk about another day. But it's interesting that after they go to the altar of sacrifice, they come back and wash again. And before they go into the holy place, they're washed. And in fact, when the priests were doing their service at the time of Yeshua, at five o'clock in the morning, all the priests that were the member of the course on duty would go and do a mikvah. What's that? They would immerse themselves. What we call a baptism. They baptized themselves. They would, and if they were to show up for the lot when they were drawing lots and they hadn't immersed, they would have been kicked out of the course. You're, you're not even eligible. So there was a lot of washing that went on. Yeshua said this interesting thing. He says, you're clean through the word I've spoken to you. And I do think that as we listen to the word, it does shape us and change us. And I don't want you to misunderstand me, but I really think we often forget that the power in the word comes from following it. Because it, it isn't always easy. It will say, love your enemies. Do good to them who despitefully use you. Pray for those who persecute you. Well, that's not natural. And in fact, if you didn't do that, you would think, well, I'm okay. No one else does either. But you come to the labor and you have been very unhappy with someone who's persecuted you or abused you. And you're going to wash in the word and the word is going to say, pray for them, love your enemies. And you have to make a decision. Do I want to be clean? Do I want to put on the mind of the Messiah? See, Paul says to clothe ourselves with the Messiah. And Isaiah says, my thoughts aren't your thoughts and my ways aren't your ways. He says, As the heavens are higher than the earth. So the labor is just something to think about as being confronted with God's truth. How many of you know that our culture today is resisting being washed by the word? Our culture has decided that they know better than God. They do. I, I've just, I, I've read this several times. In fact, 
I don't know if I'll give that example, it's too crass, but I, an archbishop literally said that if God were the way that scripture describes him to be, when he got to the pearly gates, he'd say, I want to go to the other place. And I thought, does this man know what he's saying? How many of you know that God is the way he is, not the way we think he is? And that what cleanses us is the way he is, not the way we wish he were. So the labor is very important. It, we're, Paul says we're wa that we're cleansed by the washing of the water of the word. That's how he uses it in Ephesians 5. That there's something about the word that does wash us, does cleanse us. This incense I want to spend a little time on because there's something unique about the incense that's offered in the sanctuary that's not allowed to be anywhere else. And like I mentioned, the altar of incense is only used for burning incense. And I, I, I was curious, what was incense used for? What would be your guess? Why, why did people have incense? Because probably everybody back then had incense, wouldn't you guess? In fact, uh, if you read scripture, like when a person prepared for a wedding, one of the things they did was perfume. Uh, I don't know the word. What word would you use? Uh, fumigate almost. You would fill the wedding garments with these different spices so they smelled good. Why would you guess they might have done some of this? How many of you think that if you went back 3,000 years, it might have stunk? <laughs> I don't know, but reading through Exodus and these different books, I haven't heard any mention of running water. Water was a precious commodity, and so incense is a picture of making things smell good. Uh, and also, have you noticed when you look at the worship in the tank sanctuary, how much of it involves our senses? If you came to that, you would, you would see fire, you would smell basically a steak fry, which would smell pretty good. Uh, you would see the lamps that are burning if you're in the holy place. Of course, this was only for the priest. There would be, at least on Sabbath, freshly baked bread. The altar of incense, there would be the... So that a lot of our senses are involved in worship. Incense seems to be a very important one. One of the things that struck me is it doesn't talk a lot about incense being offered properly in the Bible. You know what we find out in the Bible? All the times that people got it wrong. Who can tell me a story in the Bible of the offering of incense being misappropriated? Yeah, right off the bat, Aaron's two sons. What were they doing? They were offering incense. What was the problem with their incense? Strange fire. Isn't that what it says? Strange fire. And you, where did the fire have to come from for the incense? Had to come from the altar of sacrifice. Now here's an interesting thing when you think about it. Because of English, we say offering incense, but we're not really offering incense, are we? It's the smoke of the incense. If I had a bunch of incense here in my hand, what would it be? It, it, I mean, when you look at what they had, it was gums, resins, all kinds of different things. But you understand, it, it doesn't, it has no activity until what? It's on fire. And so it's not an offering of incense. It's an offering of incense on fire. And this is important because, as you mentioned, Nadab and Abihu. Tell me another one. Nadab and Abihu, strange fire, fire came out from the Lord and consumed them. How about the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram? Remember what they were doing when the earth opened up? 
they were angry with Aaron over apparently, especially the incense offering. Because they said, what makes you think you're holy? What makes you think you're better than everyone else? The whole assembly is holy. Well, of course they're right. But not the whole assembly was not to offer the incense. And they all appeared with their fire pans or their censers. And God was going to just strike the whole assembly. But Moses and Aaron says, no, let, everyone shouldn't die for the sin of a few. So the Lord said, separate yourselves from these three men and their families. And they did. And the earth swallowed them up. After this, here's an interesting thing. How many of you, if the earth opened up and swallowed somebody up, would think that I did it, or Ron, or Ron, or Dean? How many of you would be somewhat convinced that God did it? Now, I, I, I want to get your attention here because you know what happened right after this? They blamed Moses and Aaron and said, you have killed the Lord's anointed. About this time, God lost his patience. And a huge plague came into the camp. Do you know what Moses sent Aaron to do? Take his censer, put fire on the incense, and go stand between the people and the plague. And this is what stopped the plague. It's an interesting picture. What is incense? Really, you know, it, it's so important, and yet we don't have another story that you may remember. You remember a king named, well, it's, he, he has two different names. In the book of Kings, he's called Azariah. In Chronicles, he's called Uzziah. Do you remember this king? He reigned for 52 years. He was a good king. He was a righteous king. But he didn't come to a good end. Do you remember why? He decided that he was king and he was going to offer incense. And so he went into the temple to offer incense. And the priest came in and says, listen, you're the king. But you're not allowed to offer incense. And he just got furious. And right there, I mean, for one thing, he's in the holy place. Right there, he gets, flies into a rage and the Lord strikes him with leprosy. And, and I, I think about this, and uh, when you look at the stories, you know, that you find. And another thing was you go through Isaiah and Jeremiah, or even Kings and Chronicles, one of the other things you find is that the people are offering incense on the high places. And it goes all, it keeps mentioning this. And so I got thinking about this. And I've thought about it before, and perhaps you have too. What does incense represent? Why is it so special? Why isn't, especially this, God didn't say they couldn't have incense in their homes, but did he say the incense that belongs to him could not be used anywhere else? That was what he said. There was a particular, and it's interesting that the family that had the secret on how to make the incense wouldn't share it. And you wouldn't think it was that important, but they developed a recipe for the, these four items that it mentions in Exodus, and then they added seven more. But so apparently when this incense was lit on fire, the smoke would go to the top and then fill. And no other incense would do this. And this was the secret is gone. We don't, we don't know how they did that. But if the incense could only be offered to God, and at least in the Old Covenant could only be offered by Aaron and his sons, and it was to be perpetually before the Lord, what is that? What, what does that represent today? I think you probably all know Psalm 141. Not all the Psalms are of David, but I believe this one is. Yeah, it's in the title, A Psalm of David. O Lord, I call to you, come quickly to me, hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. So David, David recognizes a link between prayer and incense. 
What's the picture to you when Aaron carries his censer with burning coals and stands between the plague and the people? What does that look like? Intercession, doesn't that sound like it? If you have your Bibles, go to Re Revelation chapter 8. I'm going to start with the first verse of chapter 8. And Revelation is a, a very interesting book, certainly a prophetic book, but if you go back and look at Revelation, to understand it, you need to understand the temple. John could have been a Levite or an Aaronite. One of the reasons I'd say that is you remember that he is friends with the family of the high priest. Another thing you'll notice about Revelation is that it entirely, like I just said, is built around the concept of the temple. He sees seven blazing lamps. He sees a rainbow representing the Holy Spirit. He sees the Ark of the Covenant. He, he sees all these things literally in heaven. So here we are in chapter 8. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. That's always been one of those puzzling scriptures to me because... How can there be half an hour in heaven? That, that, I'll let you sort that one out. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of the saints, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, hurled it on the earth, and there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. What do you notice in this passage about the relationship between incense and prayer? They both go up, but they're not the same thing. Did you catch that? Because you would not say incense would go up together with incense. He says the prayers go up with the incense. Did you catch that? The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of the saints. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints. Now this isn't saying that prayers aren't incense. What I think it's saying is there's another dimension. First off, one of the things I remind myself in the sanctuary when we do this is that incense itself has no quality of power. It has to be on fire. I mean, there are so many things in life you'll understand. If I were to stand up there on the stage and I picked up an arrow and said, I'm throwing this arrow at you, how many of you would be afraid if you are your nuts? Because I could no more hit you with an arrow than... But you'd feel differently if I put it in a bow, wouldn't you? It suddenly becomes lethal, dangerous. Same thing with a bullet. I show a bullet and I say, Jet, I'm going to hit you with this bullet, you think. Not only is he nuts, even if he hits me, what can it do, right? We must understand that incense is that way. If it's not on fire, it doesn't produce smoke. And it's the smoke of the incense that saves our lives. It says, if Aaron goes into the most holy place without the smoke of the incense, he'll die. And I'm saying all this to remind us, there's something incense, in, in, in incense that is related to prayer, it's related to fire from the Holy Spirit, but it's related to worship. It's related to acknowledging God as king. Do you remember the story in the book of Acts where Herod had been doing a lot of things that really pleased the people? And he got up and gave a speech. And the people are so impressed. Remember what they said? It's the voice of a God. 
It's not the voice of a man. And Herod was going, oh. He struck with worms and died. That's what it says. It's one of those stories that when you're a little kid, you go, oh, really? Yuck. There's probably man-eating bacteria, flesh-eating bacteria. Flesh-eating bacteria, or what's the, all the, what are all these, uh, what do we call the conditions where people are consumed with maggots? Animals get them too. Anyway. Yeah. Well, elephantiasis is one of them. What do we call those things? It, they're disgusting. My point is that one of the things I think we need to understand is to watch out in life for anything that wants worship from us that belongs only to God. I think one of the best examples we have in the flesh that we can relate to is a husband and a wife. And people confuse this. Sometimes they, yeah, I won't go there either. But uh, I'm married to Joy and I love Joy. I love my kids. I've got three of my sons and a daughter sitting here. I love them, I think, probably as much as I do Joy. There are things that are, that belong in joy in my relationship that belong in no other relationship. And if they were to get outside of that relationship, they would bring death. The worship of God is that way. When it talks about worship, it says to know Him, to have an intimacy with Him. There's something about that that brings power, that covers us, but it can't go anywhere else because if it does, it brings death. And it's interesting as you read through history, the number of people who have put down God. I mean, I remember John Lennon. I kind of like the Beatles, and I, I think a lot of the reason I like the Beatles is because someone told me they were of the devil. And I listened to him and I said, I want to hold your hand, it's just neat. It's not devilish. I, I mean, I, you know, how many of you know kids can be rebellious? I was. But I remember John Lennon talking about Christianity and saying, you know, he says, Jesus was okay, but his disciples were so thick and ordinary. And then he made this comment. He says, we're more popular than Jesus. And I was thinking about that because John Lennon is very dead. And Yeshua is alive. But Karl Marx said that religion is the opiate of the masses. And of course what he means is, Religion is that thing. All of us have a need in our lives for medication. We need something to help us get through. And for those poor, floundering masses, religion is the thing that gets them through. I'd also point out that he is dead. And what's more, his ideas are dead. They're bad ideas. His ideas that if you turn the mastery of the world over to the worker, the worker will always watch out for other workers and things will be great. One of the dumbest ideas ever. Stinks to the high heavens. Stupid. But he said it well. Voltaire couldn't stand Christianity. Just hated it. And he, he was a very bright man, wrote a lot of, whoa, it was X-rated literature back there. Back then, if you want to read something to curl your hair, read Candide. Don't. Uh, but a smart guy. But he said Christianity is going to disappear. It's, it's a, just dissipating. It's going to flee away. And I love the fact that 150 years after his death, his printing presses were busy and going on. You know what they were doing? They were printing Gideon Bibles. I think it's literal and real that incense belongs only to God. That when it gets anywhere else, it brings death and destruction. Not because God wants to destroy us, but some things are just, that's the way they are. I, th I think we all know that when, I forget the names of these spaceships. Was it the Challenger that had the bad O-ring? I think it was. The Challenger did not blow up because somebody wanted it to blow up. The Challenger didn't blow up because someone purposely booby-trapped it. The Challenger blew up because it broke a law. It had a defective O-ring which caused it to leak and it exploded. 
Sometimes people don't realize that in God's moral universe we have the same things and sometimes they're like the challenger. It takes a few seconds. Sometimes it takes a hundred years. But this story of the incense is something that really motivates me because I believe that the people who are giving God their intercession, their prayer, and their worship and not allowing it to go anywhere else are the people they're going to find blessing. And that anything that tempts us, seduces us, thinks that we can worship, pray to, depend on anything else, actually will lead to our destruction. In Malachi, it makes a prediction for I think the day that we live in. From the rising of the sun even to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name and a grain offering that is pure. For my name will be great among the nations, says Yahweh Tzaviot. You think about that. He doesn't just say incense will be offered in one place, does he? He says, in every place, incense is going to be offered to my name, and my name will be great among the nations. Something to think about, reflect on. You know, it's kind of interesting. We all like good smells. But I'm a person that my favorite smell is fresh air. I've been a trial to my wife and a lot of people because my view of colognes, aftershaves, perfumes is, whoa. Give, give me, yeah. The, the, honest, the honest truth is the smell of manure smells a lot better than a lot of that stuff to me. In fact, I, it's, it's weird. How many of you have certain smells when you smell them they bring very pleasant memories. Go ahead, Ron. Well, you bring us up about incense, and the smoke of the incense is so important. So I went to Mass one time with friends of mine, and they walk around with the... Yeah, with the little... The they incense, did that. And my nose started to run so bad that I was looking for... And every time we talk about this, I just... I just... I hope it's different incense. <laughs> well, you know, the, the thing I was going to say is... The smoke of the incense, we offer it not because we like it, but it's for him. And, but I mean, we are very olfactory in nature, good smells. Uh, I think, who doesn't like walking into a kitchen and smelling fresh baked bread? That's one of the great, I mean, it's just an amazing, you can be full and it smells good. And, and here, I will admit I'm strange. I love the smell of an old barn. Oh, I love that smell. I love the smell. I walk into an old corral and I can, I, I can tell. Horses were here. Cows were here. I like it. It's weird. <laughs> but, but I'm allowed to like that because some people like those other smells that your nose runs, my respiratory passages close up and I, I kind of laugh because Joy's always after me because she says I, I've got the nose of a hound and being around my dad as much as I am, I know where I got it. He smells everything. And uh, as we close, God is honored in so many ways and he's called us to offer him pure incense. And just one of the things we can remind ourselves, it isn't the incense he wants, it's the smoke of the incense. So his tr your prayers, your intercessions, your worship, they're all dear to him but they need to be offered with that fire so that that smoke arises. Thank you.